But the thing that's different is, notice this goes back thousands of years ago. So this is like 800,000 years ago. Like how in the heck do you get carbon dioxide back then? And have you, if you've seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow, which is a great kind of older flick, where um, basically um, the, the North America or the Northern Hemisphere, I don't know, freezes over. And anyway, um, it starts out where guys are getting ice cores, you know, and so that's actually a good source for getting at what was the carbon dioxide, you know, ba back 800,000 years ago. Basically, you find a fresh place uh, ice sheet, and um, ice is great at trapping what the gases were at the time. And so um, you carefully preserve your ice sheet and then kind of tap down there and see what sort of gases you have. Um, so the thing here is carbon dioxide's gone up and down. And this is sometimes what people will say. Ah, science will say that carbon dioxide's gone up and down and up and down and up and down. But notice that um, it kind of has peaked maybe 300 parts per million-ish. And then this last bit over here is kind of the... We're, we were on an upswing, and basically this would be like the mid-1800s where it just, you know, has kind of gone up ever since. So that's kind of that tail end. I mean, that's not an artifact. This right here is contemporary. That spiky thing. So that, that's where the concern is, you know. And carbon dioxide is great at... Um, basically acting like a blanket to the earth. And any sort of heat that the earth has, it's pretty good at kind of redirecting the heat back. Um, so, um, all right. Back to variable gases. So this isn't a variable gas. Remember, the variable gases are carbon dioxide, um, well, water, vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone. And we're still going to talk about ozone and water coming up. But in general, if somebody talks about aerosols, kind of think about an aerosol can. And what you're doing, basically, with your hairspray or something like that, is you have some sort of carrier gas um, that wants to carry your liquid, gooey stuff that puts on your hair. So basically, it kind of sprays it out. So basically, if you could kind of look at your hairspray, you'd see suspended little liquid particles. So an aerosol is basically um, something that's suspended in the earth. It could be a liquid or a solid. Um, aerosols are good, bad, okay. But one of the things about aerosols is if you get too many of those suspended liquid or solid particles, then they kind of get in your way of seeing past it. So it reduces visibility. Fog is maybe a type of aerosol. If you've ever seen fog, if you've uh, stood in fog before, if you look really closely, you can actually kind of see gravity kicking in and kind of those little droplets of liquid falling down. So it's kind of neat. Um, but aerosols can also, remember when I said volcanoes can be good at those particulates, can serve to seed clouds? That's what this is talking about, seeding clouds right here. Okay, I called those a minute ago, I called those uh, cloud condensation nuclei particles, CCNs. Um, so the thing about aerosols is if you get too far above the Earth's surface, you're going to kind of run out of them, okay, because the Earth's surface is kind of home to the solid particles, um, so they're both abundant near the Earth's surface. So with regard to aerosols, actually this is a, a photo from your textbook, and I don't know necessarily where to draw the line, but we have... Um, a natural, okay, a natural sort of situation in which aerosols are running around, okay, and then here we have anthropogenic source of aerosols, anthropogenic, and it's hard to see where one ends and the other begins, kind of. Um, one of the things about aerosols, now, um, so if aerosols are dust, have you guys ever probably, if you've lived in Iowa very long at all, you've noticed like um, in harvest time, definitely depending upon the mo moisture in the soil, you can see all sorts of dust. On it. And um, we can have some beautiful sunrises and sunsets um, around harvest time. Our aerosols can kind of, we'll talk about 
about why sunrise and sunsets are kind of orangish red in the next chapter. But um, so uh, another variable gas we talked about carbon dioxide. Ozone is a variable gas, but in order to talk about ozone, I need to talk about the two types of ozone and the two types of ozone are different in where they're located in the atmosphere. So there's good ozone, okay, um, in what we call the stratosphere, and I have this term coming up. Stratosphere is just the second layer of the Earth's atmosphere, so good ozone is there. Um, and the reason it's good is actually um, when the sun radiates all different sort of wavelengths or different types of energy, one of the energies is actually cancer-causing, and that's ultraviolet radiation. And so ozone in the stratosphere helps to kind of intercept that harmful energy, and so it doesn't most likely to appear. Now, ozone in the stratosphere, though, can be screwed up or depleted by um, chlorofluorocarbons, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. And CFCs used to be the number one choice for um, air conditioners and puffing agents. Um, but since the 1970s, that we've tried to, actually worldwide, which is exciting, tried to wean everybody away from CFCs, which has been pretty successful. Now, there's another type of ozone, and if you've ever been driving down the road near a town or in a city, like Chicago or St. Louis, and sometimes they have these road signs that light up, you know, they can kind of change these alerts. So this would be a changeable alert, and this one says ozone alert Thursday, 8, 12, 10. So again, ozone, it's O3, okay, but it's in this layer, not the stratosphere, it's actually in, this is called the troposphere, we're coming up with that word too. Um, so bad ozone, and it's just a byproduct of pollution. It's a sec what we call secondary pollutant. And bad ozone is bad because if, uh, especially like little kids have asthma, um, and ozone here, where we're walking around, actually can make it very hard for them to breathe. Um, so just a little more about the ozone. I have a couple of slides. Um, I mentioned that of the, the good ozone actually can be compromised by CFCs, which like I said, we've done, um, I think I said 1970, I guess it was 1987, where um, the nations came together and said, let's see what we can do about this. Um, the problem with, um, with kind of nixing the CFCs, which deplete the ozone, I mean, that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but it's going to take about 100 years for that O3 to replenish itself. So we're getting there. Um, so if you've ever heard people talk about the ozone hole, okay, so that would be the good ozone layer in the stratosphere, and it's seasonal. Sometimes people don't really kind of relay that um, what happens is near the poles, I'll kind of describe why it's near the poles, um, about springtime in that hemisphere, um, the, um, the, in the stratosphere, the good ozone basically has a soft spot. Okay, that's the hole in the ozone layer. Okay, and it's in the Antarctic, uh, Antarctic and Arctic. I guess most predominantly in the southern hemisphere over the South Pole. So here's kind of how that works. Um, in the poles, okay, it's kind of cold, okay, negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit, okay, and because it's so cold, we can get a special type of cloud called a polar stratospheric cloud, or PSC, okay. Did you guys, I don't know if you guys remember, but I said that actually most clouds are in the troposphere, the stratosphere, that's a really high cloud, so it's a really fancy cloud that's kind of just related to the poles. Um, the thing about this special type of cloud is it's pretty good at tying up your loose CFCs, the nasty chemical that breaks down ozone. So basically, if you have a cloud, if you have a cloud there, your CFCs are tied up and they aren't ruining your ozone. Now, clouds are pretty good when it's nice and cold. So the problem comes in springtime when the poles starts to warm up. And so those fancy clouds, they actually can break up because it's warmer. It's not cold enough to make the polar stratospheric clouds. And so as they break up, okay, um, and notice that I put October here, okay, because the Antarctic's in the southern hemisphere. You, 
guys know the seasons are switched. So when we're having fall, they're having spring. So what's fall for us, October, is actually spring for them. So about the springtime, it starts warming up from the chilly 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? And that means those polar stratospheric clouds start to go ahead and go away for the spring and the summer. Now, all kind of at once, basically, the cloud kind of disintegrates and it releases those gases, the CFCs, that then just do their thing kind of all at once and compromise the, the ozone that's there. So it's a temporary situation and it's seasonal and it's local, okay? So if somebody, you know, if you think about it, when talk, if I talk about the ozone hole, it really is kind of the Antarctic and the Arctic. So the blue area... It'd be the kind of the, um, the thinner areas of ozone. So um, this one over here on uh, the, wait, okay, both of them the same. These are just different years. So we're looking at the Antarctica. There's a comment down there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're looking down at the uh, southern hemisphere um, two years apart. And to me, it looks like the hole is getting, oh, let's see. Looks like the hole is getting bigger, 2013. Let's see. This is the extent of the ozone hole. So we have 1980. It looks like the ozone hole kept getting bigger. And it's not till, so 87 was the protocol. Now I'm just kind of looking at this data like you guys. 95, this was the extent of the hole. Now look, we want this area to get smaller. Okay. I don't know if this is an anomaly or not, but we went down. You know, so I'm hoping it's going to go down. So. All right. So uh, water or humidity, we're going to talk about, won't be till. The next unit, I think, we'll talk about how do you wrangle up a number for how much water vapor there is in the atmosphere, okay? Um, but definitely water vapor or humidity in the atmosphere will change from day to day and from location to location. And um, we'll talk in, I think, chapter two about the whole water vapor basically turning from gas to a liquid, and then liquid, if it gets cold enough, turns to a solid. So we'll kind of talk about those phase changes. Coming up. So um, make sure we're all on the same page here. Whenever I say um, water vapor, that's also like water gas. Okay. And in terms of kind of words we've talked about tonight, um, the word aerosol is basically a liquid or solid that's suspended, okay? It could be falling through. So actually, um, uh, snow and liquid precipitation are both types of aerosols. All right. So how, um, how dense or how thick is the air? So that's kind of this topic here. One of the things... If I were to ask you guys, if you climb a mountain, what happens to the thickness of the air? It gets thinner. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly what I was after. Yeah. Um, climbing a mountain, the air gets thinner. Um, so down here then, not off on the mountain, basically we have what we call dense air. So it just means that you have a lot of air particles packed close together. And does this make sense that down here our, our, um, the pressure of our air is going to be higher than if we go up there? That's true, too. They will be thinner up there and less pressure. Um, okay, so, yeah, this next statement's kind of say exactly what I said. So um, near the Earth's surface, um, the gas particles are packed close together. One of the things I think is helpful in meteorology and just in science is if you kind of almost picture the, the gas particles. So picture gas particles crammed together tightly here at the Earth's surface. And if you climb a mountain, there's air particles, but there's a lot more space between them. Okay. Um, so it looks like this. We're down here. This is closer to the Earth's surface, and you can kind of see the little balls or gas particles get less as you go up. Okay. 
So the increase in density um, as you go closer to the Earth's surface is due to several factors. One is all those gas particles are held in place because of the gravity of the Earth, and the gravity is, close, is strongest near the Earth's surface. Okay. Another thing is that gases, they got space between them, gas particles, and gas particles actually can be squeezed. And one of the things we say about gases is they'll take on any volume that you give them. So if you've ever used like um, liquid gases, like liquid nitrogen or compressed air or something like that, basically what they've done is to take air and squeeze it into a can. And you can even squeeze it until it becomes a liquid. Um, all right, so we're probably good with that idea. Hmm. Cool. So gases are like my favorite phase of matter. So a matter can be a solid, matter can be a liquid, matter can be a gas. Gases are like the best. Um, so um, all gases exert a pressure. And so if you're a visual person, I really kind of like to think of each one of these gas particles as having almost a life of their own. And we could kind of show, for instance, that gas particle is moving that way. You know, this gas particle is moving this way, okay, et cetera. And actually, if you were on the receiving end of these, where the gas particles are moving, all gases exert what we call a pressure. So they're almost like, it's almost like, like little ping pong balls. And so actually here as we're walking around, the pressure is about um, 13 PSI, about 13 pounds per square inch is what these gas particles are. If you climb a mountain, guess what? There's fewer gas particles and they exert less of a pressure. Um, so the pressure they exert depends upon how dense they are. So for instance, that elevation, I have three gas particles within this area, if I take a similar area here and I were to go ahead and draw arrows, I got a lot more gas particles, okay, so I'm going to get banged up. The other thing, quite frankly, we'll talk more about this, is temperature. Um, so here where it says how fast the gas particles are moving, I'm going to say increase temperature, okay, it will increase um, speed, how fast they're moving. Okay, so up here, if you were to go ahead and, I don't know how you do this, but to localize some of those cute little gas particles, zap them with a little bit of thermal energy, make them go faster, they would kick more butt, okay? There would be a greater pressure. So it's kind of how many there are and how fast they're moving. Um, so if I draw kind of a couple of arrows here, here, here on this column of air, okay? There at the top, I would say things like lower density, okay, at the top. I would say things like um, less gas pressure, okay, less atmospheric pressure. That would be like climbing a mountain. And here at the bottom would be like kind of analogous is to the Earth's surface. Um, here I would say that greater gas pressure and um, greater density. Okay, so kind of saying the same thing. So here are a couple of pictures talking about density and elevation. Let's start with the one on the right. Okay. This actually looks very similar to what we were looking at, where here it's dense, okay, and here it's sparse. Okay. This over here is a little more complicated, and if you want to put an HW, I, th I think, I can't remember if you have a homework. It really doesn't matter. Your homework um, will kind of direct you to look at some figures and kind of analyze them. But there are a couple things on this figure so the way you read it, for instance, if, if we went up, let's see, let's look, let's pick on this. What if we went up four kilometers, okay? So if you wanted to know what the pressure is, it would look like this. You would find four kilometers and you would see where it intersects with the red line, okay? And then you would, am I doing that right? Oh, yeah, I'm doing it right. Okay, so then what you do is you go down. Let me undo that. Four right here. Then you go down to here, 
Do you see where, how that works? So at four kilometers, you have 600 millibars pressure. What, let's pick on 12. What about 12 kilometers? What sort of millibars do you have? What do you think? 200. Yep, I'm looking like, I'm liking that. Does that make sense? Cool. So 600 millibars if you go up four kilometers, um, 200 millibars if you go up 12 kilometers, that makes sense. All right. Layers of the Earth's atmosphere going up. Okay, so the, the bottom one, or the troposphere, is right here. And then going up, we have the stratosphere, and going up, we have the mesosphere, and going up, we have the thermosphere. And these can all be, you know you hit a new level, a new layer, if you have, take a thermometer with you. If you take a thermometer with you and look at, is the temperature getting warmer or colder, you know if you're in the next layer, basically. Okay. Um, and... The lower three levels, the troposphere and the stratosphere and the mesosphere, have these things called pauses. Like instead of the, the um, troposphere, actually there's a tropopause that goes on top of the troposphere. There's a stratopause on top of the stratosphere. There's a mesopause on top of the mesosphere. So here we go. So it looks really busy, so let's kind of take... Kind of break down. Anytime you're faced with a figure, um, I guess I could say go get a cup of coffee and then come back to the figure if you're like, what? I have no idea. That looks like the letter E to me or something. So notice um, what we have here along the, be the x-axis is we have temperature. Kind of get your bearings. Here we have zero. This would be Fahrenheit. Okay. And here we have zero Celsius. Kind of look at what you got there. Um, the way this graph goes is we basically have height on both sides, like elevation going up in elevation. You can pick either metric or English, you know, kilometers or miles. So then the real information comes from that red squiggly line, okay? So basically, let's change it from a, my marker from a red to like a blue. If we were going to go up at the top of kind of Mount Everest, okay, uh, from sea level, go at the top of Mount Everest. Okay, notice that what's happening is the red line is getting, it's going colder, colder, colder. So here at sea level, what temperature does it look like it is, kind of? 18 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah, about 18 degrees Celsius. 18 or 20 degrees Celsius, exactly. Whenever you have to read this, you just kind of estimate. That sounds good to me. So let's pick a different color. All right, so yep. So what happens, what is the temperature as you get up to Mount Everest? The negatives always throw me off. Yeah, I'm liking it. I was going to say negative 38, but it's negative 42, exactly. <laughs> yep, I'm liking that, negative 42. Yep. Okay, so as you go up in elevation, it gets colder. You're like, no, duh, I knew that, right? But let's just, for kicks, say what happens if you get, you climb, um, you leave the troposphere. The next layer is stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere. Okay, so let's go ahead and go up from an, ele so what elevation is the top of Mount Everest? That's hard to tell. I don't know. Yeah, I think eight would be good. Eight kilometers, I'm kind of liking that. So let's say you go from eight kilometers, let's say you go up to uh, 40 kilometers. Let me pick a different color. I'll pick purple. 40 kilometers. So what's the temperature there? Yeah, like negative 20 degrees Celsius, exactly. So it went from 
what we say, negative, a chilly negative 42 to negative 20. I know negative 20 is cold, but it's warmer than negative 40. Okay, so that's why here in the stratosphere, and actually I go ahead and kind of show these, you think you have some blanks to fill in. So if you're in the troposphere and you're going up, it's going to get colder. And the troposphere is next to the Earth's surface. Once you leave the troposphere, if you have a thermometer with you, it should start getting warmer as you go up in elevation. Okay, so in the stratosphere, temperature will increase. And you kind of start, we've done two zigzags. We've gone this way, which must be getting cooler, and we've gone that way, which must be getting warmer. Now you see another zigzag in the mesosphere. So the mesosphere, it's the same as the troposphere, so it's getting cooler again. So temperature decreases. And the problem with the last layer of the Earth's atmosphere, and you'll read this in your textbook, is it kind of becomes, at what point do you say you ran out of gas particles that are part of our atmosphere. At what point are you willing to call it a Because basically the air gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner, so it becomes a little more space between your next gas particle. Okay, so it just kind of, we say, kind of peters out to outer space. Um, here's where, when you get to outer space, how hot or cold is it in outer space? And I've kind of Googled this a few times. It kind of depends upon your proximity to a star. Okay. So if you're in the vicinity of our sun, which I guess you probably would be if you're beyond Earth's orbit in the vicinity of the Earth, okay, um, it will be very hot. Okay. Um, so it gets hotter as you go up. So that's how that works. So we'll talk about each of the layers just a little bit. The troposphere is this one that we're walking around in. I have a, a couple figures to show you that actually the troposphere um, it, uh, its thickness varies a lot. Okay, we're going to see it's thickest near the equator and thinnest near the poles. The top of the troposphere is the tropopause. Um, even though, um, well, how do I say this? It's got the most gas particles, but it, literally it's, the, it's not very deep. It's like squishy, and you can actually kind of see that on the previous slide. It didn't look very thick. Um, so the reason it gets colder as you go up in this layer of the Earth's atmosphere is because the geosphere, the Earth, the chunky part of the Earth, is a great at, at absorbing energy, and then it kind of acts as like a little radiator. So that's kind of what, what warms the atmosphere. We'll talk later, and maybe you've heard on um, weather reports this phenomenon called a temperature inversion. A temperature inversion actually is kind of what's happening in the stratosphere and the thermosphere. Basically, a temperature inversion is um, where it gets warmer as you go up. Okay? But what we usually call, talk about is the temperature inversion in the troposphere. So it's really weird, but it definitely happens, and it's a player in kind of some strange weather, is if you go up, it, instead of getting colder, it gets warmer in the, in the troposphere. Okay, so um, you're like, uh, well, how do we know what kind of what we, we call it temperature profile? How do we know that it's getting um, colder, for instance, as you go up in the troposphere? Well, twice a day throughout the world, these dedicated crazy people are sending up these balloons. And you can see he's proudly got a little, it looks like a Chinese box right here, Chinese takeout. That actually has um, equipment like uh, instrumentation in it that can send back remotely. It usually senses um, uh, temperature, uh, pressure, wind speed, wind direction. Okay. Um, so the other thing, and we'll probably see more about weather balloons, but um, you guys told me as you go up, uh, the air gets thinner. Okay. So one of the things is that the gas particles in this balloon kind of exciting. Okay. The gas particles in this balloon, which is I think usually helium, okay, as it goes up and the air gets thinner, basically those gas particles go wee and they go ahead and they, they bang out the latex of that balloon and the balloon gets bigger, okay, the air gets thinner, the balloon gets bigger, the air gets thinner, the balloon gets bigger. It can be, get about the size of a house. I don't know what size of a house, but the size of a house. Okay. 
then the latex uh, can't take that volume anymore, so it bursts. And there's somewhere in here, I think, there's like a little, um, little parachute in the gizmo. And so the gizmo safely goes back down to the ground. It doesn't send back anything then. It sends it when it's going up, but when, and they go find it. On my bucket list is to find one. <laughs> um, so, um, so it can take things more than just temperature. But when it takes temperature as it goes up, we actually call that the environmental lapse rate, or the ELR. We'll be talking more about ELR. But basically, lapse rate, it's just saying how is the temperature getting cooler as it's going up. Or if there's a temperature inversion place in place, you know, how is the temperature changing as it goes up. Um, usually, typically, the temperature gets cooler about 6.5 degrees Celsius for every one kilometer it rises. Okay? So if it was at 0 Celsius here, it goes up one kilometer, it would be, what, negative 6.5. It goes up a total of two kilometers, and it's what negative thirteen. Okay, that's kind of what we have. Cool. So this just this last one talks about kind of the name for this thing is a radio sound. Radio sound. Radio sound. It gives temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction. All right. So I mentioned the troposphere actually can vary from a 3 to 11 miles thick or kilometers thick. But the troposphere is thinnest near the poles and thickest near the equator. And here's another figure to kind of reinforce that. These are at three different latitudes. Now, I think it's in Chapter 2 where I kind of emphasize what I mean by latitude, but... Hopefully we're all kind of on the same page if you've run into this term before. So uh, the equator is here, okay? So lines of latitude actually go like this. So we have lines of latitude going like this. Okay, so this where it says um, the red one is the tropical latitude, okay? So that would be kind of near the equator, okay? So basically what it's saying is... Um, where is the tropopause, which is the top of the troposphere, and it's saying it's the it's the hot it's the thickest. Okay, what do you how many kilometers you got? Maybe seventeen kilometers. 17. seventeen kilometers, me too. So contrast that to um, where the tropopause begins um, near the poles. About nine kilometers. So near the poles, the top of the troposphere is this, this mess. Closer to the surface. Okay, so that was all about the troposphere. The stratosphere um, is a little more uniform with regard to um, how far above the or surface it is. Um, extends about 12 miles. Okay. We talked about good ozone. The good ozone is in the stratosphere. And actually, the good ozone is um, kind of what um, gives the stratosphere its kind of temperature profile. As you go up in the stratosphere, you're getting closer to the ozone, which is kind of like a little mini radiator. So you're getting closer to the heat source, so that's why it's getting warmer. Okay. Um, there are some clouds in the stratosphere. Remember we talked about polar stratospheric clouds? Yes, see? Um, a lot of times jet planes like to kind of catch these fast-moving winds in the stratosphere. Then we go to the mesosphere and the thermosphere. And um, I noted in your book recently that, and this kind of makes sense, they said that that mesosphere is less, we let know less about that than we do the thermosphere. Because you figure the thermosphere is kind of like where we actually kind of have some satellite activity, you know. Where the mesosphere, not so much. <coughs> so it's the least explored. And then the thermosphere kind of peters into outer space. So um, we said that in the thermosphere, temperatures get warmer again as you go up. But temperature is a weird thing that um, in order for something to have a temperature, you need to have, like, atoms to measure the temperature of it. <laughs> um, so... 
The other thing, and it kind of actually has to do with you have to have atoms, is in order for something to have a certain amount of thermal energy or heat, and we'll talk more about that, you need to have atoms to have thermal energy. So um, if there aren't very many gas particles up there, there's really a minimal amount of heat, even though that's a high temperature, 1,000 degrees Celsius. Okay, then the last couple of slides kind of go together. Um, also on my bucket list is seeing some northern lights. Okay, um, and the reason they're northern lights is because actually the phenomenon that creates them has to kind of enter in at the poles. Um, the not the geographic pole, the actually the magnetic pole. So you can actually have southern lights too, but it's closer here. So the reason we have northern lights has to do with kind of a fifth layer of the atmosphere called the ionosphere. The ionosphere is actually a couple of layers we already talked about. It's the upper mesosphere and then onto the um, thermal, through the thermosphere. So they call it the ions, ionosphere because ions are there. And if you're kind of familiar with what an ion is, it has to do with something that lost electrons or gained electrons. In this case, basically, um, we have kind of extra electrons um, moving around um, atoms that have lost their electrons or molecules that have lost their electrons. Um, so to just kind of finish that thought with regard to ionosphere creating um, northern lights. So we get an extra dose of, um, of charged particles from the sun, which kind of promotes this ion creation when the sun is active um, with solar flares and coronal mass ejections, that sort of thing. And when the sun does its thing, the earth is pretty good at kind of just taking a certain amount of, of charged particles from the sun, but it has a capacity. And so actually um, uh, it can get overloaded, the atmosphere can get overloaded, and the weak spot is going to be at the poles. Okay, so that's why you're going to kind of kind of see particles cascading down through the poles. I think that's it. Any questions? Got a weird one actually. Uh, does our atmosphere, are, all right, our oceans are affected by the moon, you know, how it adds mm -hmm. the poles, tides, yeah, the tides. Yeah. Is our atmosphere at all affected by the uh, gravity well from the moon? The, is our atmosphere kind of That's a good shift? question. I like, uh, don't know. I don't think so. I think when I've seen photos, it's usually been of the, um, the, the large bodies of water being pulled mm -hmm. towards the moon and uh, yeah. to a little lesser extent than the sun, but yeah. yeah, and I think that the, I've seen, the figures I've seen is the atmosphere is kind of the same uniform thickness. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Not that I know of. I like it. Anything else? How close do you have, have to get to see the northern lights? Do you have to be there's, close? There's a website out there, and I'll kind of, I'll bring it up next week, um, but it depends like the website I'm going to show you has kind of shows a sweet spot. So um, sometimes it actually will kind of, I've seen it kind of show it dip down here, you know, so you'd have to drive up to here to kind of see the northern lights. Sometimes if the sun's really active, got extra charged particles, it can, those um, uh, electrons can be cascading down and creating the effect so that it kind of drips down even further. Um, I've got friends that are into that sort of thing, and so they're like, hey, you know, so what does it have northern lights? still have never seen them. So every once in a while, and if you hear the sun's going to be active or something like that, so you just need dark skies and look north. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Awesome. So that's all I got for tonight. Yeah, a few minutes early. So next week, Chapter 1, will we do? And I'll post this lecture in case you wanted to hear anything again, but... Okay. If you have any questions, let me know.